the Messiah has made all things new. We've got a new covenant, we're a new creation, new heavens, new earth, a new age, new Jerusalem, new life, and a new name. The old covenant represents the old heaven and earth. The old heavens and earth represent the old creation. The old creation represents the old Jerusalem. All of these things represent the old age. Adam, Abraham, Moses, Jesus. Each of these were shadows of what was to come with the Messiah in that they were physical, worldly examples of our relationship with God. Jesus was going to make everything new and not of this world. The ministry Jesus has received is a superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one and it is founded on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbour, or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least to the greatest, for I will forgive their wickedness, and will remember their sins no more. It's interesting that God says that this new covenant is made with Israel after that time because the land of Israel has little or nothing to do with the covenant of today. He's speaking of the spiritual Israel which is the church, the true Jews and the children of Abraham. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete and what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. If the old covenant was already obsolete, then the only way it was going to disappear was when the temple itself, the final symbol of the law, was taken down. The Jews should have taken it down themselves upon their faith in Jesus, but they did not and rejected him. And therefore, God removed it by force, with fire, under the heavy hand of the Roman Empire in the first century, when General Titus melted it on the anniversary of the destruction of the first temple under Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. The written testimony states in Corinthians, you show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. And Sister Catherine mentioned this in one of her videos, I believe, um, the wicked one, I can't remember which part. And the written testimony goes on to say, 
such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The written letter reminds us of sin and death, reminds us we're sinners. The Spirit of life means exactly that, life. And in it there is no death at all, and no condemnation, and no law. Now if a ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? Hallelujah! For what was glorious had, has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was folding away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? The living word, the spirit of life. And therefore, since we have a hope or we have such a hope, we are bold. We're not like Moses, who will put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at him, to gazing at the glory, pardon me, while the radiance is fading away, but their minds were made dull. For to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Now, if you want to stay in the law, good luck to you. You stay in that law, that written law. But as you well know, brothers and sisters, no man is able to keep the law in the fullness except one the Messiah Jesus Christ, who kept the law perfectly, and thus making it obsolete. Now if you want to stay in the law, you're saying Christ didn't keep the law to the fullness. He kept the law to the fullness, so you didn't have to stay in the law. Step out of it, step away from it, run away from it as far as you can because it's holding you back. It's keeping, the Messiah, it's keeping you from the Messiah, from you becoming one with this Messiah within you. Step out of the written and into the spiritual, brothers and sisters. Now, the problem is those who haven't entered into Christ are still under the law because the law exists for those who are not in Christ and therefore they will be judged by the law. So now it's clear that the old covenant was obsolete and its glory had faded. So this is why it was an abomination for his people to continue to make sacrifices. But Jesus fulfilled those sacrifices already. Their rejection of his son was a rejection of the Father. For this reason, Messiah and the Apostles compared their generation of Jews to the people of whom the wrath of the flood of Noah fell upon. This is what ties them to the wrath upon the old creation. The written word goes on to say, You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, 
to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Abel's blood is brought up because the sins of the world, going back to the first days of creation itself, were not atoned for. Nor was the blood of the righteous avenged until the coming fiery flood on Jerusalem. That same creation was cursed for the sins of his father Adam. That's why there was a covenant with Abraham to redeem a people not of the creation he was born into. This is why, century later, the law was given to Moses to introduce himself and his son to the people of a sinful and cursed creation. creation. The Father in his mercy did this, set this in motion. And the law was given at Mount Sinai which is a mountain of the creation. The city of Jerusalem was founded in the land of Israel, which were part of the creation. So what we have is a creation unatoned for and unavenged. Since the new covenant represents the new creation in Christ, then it makes sense that the old covenant that was fading was going to be removed in a way similar to the way Noah's wicked generation were destroyed. And let's have a look at the written testimony from both the Old and New Testimonies about the end coming upon the city of Jerusalem and the temple at the appointed time like a flood. from Daniel. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Clearly, the transgression of the holy city was their unfaithfulness to the old covenant and the rejection of the prophets. The end to sin and atonement, hallelujah, were at the cross. And since these are so, then that means that the other events that must have been accomplished during that time, which was the sealing up of vision and prophecy, because all was fulfilled. Again, we revert back to the written testimony. Know and understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Anointed One, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the sixty-two sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation. Until the end that is decreed, 
is poured out on him. Father's method of the flood upon the holy city was war. And this war w would continue until the end. I'm suggesting that it was the end of the old covenant and old age and the fulfillment of prophecy. Father had promised Noah that he would not again flood the entire planet with water. So this flood of war and fire will be localized. Calling this war in Jerusalem a flood also means it will be a total surprise upon evil, upon evil people. They'll see it coming but scoff at its delay. But once it comes, it's too late. The surprise is overwhelming, just as in a real flood. You cannot stop it until you realize it's upon you. And this was the case with the Jews. When they rebelled against Rome's authority in 66 AD and invoked the first Jewish-Roman war that lasted three and a half years interestingly enough and would end up with the temple's desolation these concepts are certainly not foreign to anything jesus warned of about his generation their wickedness and their punishment of a flood again in the written testimony but first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People eating, drinking, marrying, being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating, drinking, buying, selling, planting, building. But the day that Lot left Sodom, fire and sulphur came down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like... Ooh. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is on the roof of his house with his goods inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Jesus compares his days to those of Noah's and Lot's. The common theme is that the people to receive this wrath of the fiery flood is that they are completely caught off guard, exactly like the thief in the night warning. Jesus tells the people he's talking to, remember Lot's wife? Why? Why would he tell this to them unless it was applied specifically to them? God always raised up prophets in times of distress and impending judgment. And by telling them to remember Lot's wife, he's telling them to leave the city and not look back. In Luke, I have come to bring a fire on earth, and how I wish it already were already kindled. Matthew, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather his wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The Holy Spirit baptism was a few days after Jesus' resurrection on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, where Peter quotes Joel 2 in saying that the last days were upon them he declared it, and the sign for it was the Holy Spirit baptism. 
But the Holy Spirit baptism was only the first baptism Christ had for that generation. The baptism of the Holy Spirit was then a sign that the one of fire remained and they had 40 years to escape it. The baptism of spirit was grace, fire is wrath. In Acts, no, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. But the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord, sorry, before the coming and great and glorious day of the Lord, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So again, here is the baptism of the spirit and fire being fulfilled in the last days of the old covenant and the old age, the end of the old age. Peter also applied his generation of false teachers and evildoers to that of Noah and Lot in 2 Peter 2, 1 to 10. In the next chapter, he brings up the last days again, which he says began when the Spirit was poured out. 2 Peter 3. First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our father died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. And by these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Remember that the Spirit poured out was the sign that the fire poured out was to come and that they were in the last days. Let's read on from the written testimony. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. As you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. Yes, the day of the Lord comes like a thief, just like the flood comes upon the wicked generation. The heavens and earth ties this statement to the creation, which was a witness against the Jews. We refer to the written testimony in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy 4, 25. After you, had, after you have had children and grandchildren, and have lived in the land a long time, if you then become corrupt and make any kind of idol, doing evil in the eyes of the Lord your God and provoking him to anger, I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you this day 
that you will quickly perish from the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. You will not live there long, but you will certainly be destroyed. In Deuteronomy 30, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. The blessing is the baptism of the Spirit, Jesus' covenant, and the curses are the destruction and loss of their land and inheritance, eternal destruction. Let's go on. Deuteronomy 31. And the Lord said to Moses, You are going to rest with your fathers, and these people will soon prostitute themselves to the foreign gods of the land they are entering. They will forsake me and break the covenant I made with them. On that day I will become angry with them and forsake them. I will hide my face from them and they will be destroyed. Many disasters and difficulties will come upon them, and on that day they will ask, Have not these disasters come upon us because our God is not with us? And I will certainly hide my face on that day because of all their wickedness in turning to other gods. And as we can see, the, the things that makes the father, father's anger burn is turning to other idols in whatever form that is. Concerning the elements being destroyed by the fire, David Tilton once said, through the New Testament, the word elements, stoichia, is always used in connection with the old covenant order. And this is true and can be verified with the Greek lexon. And this proves only more that the covenant and creation are inseparable. So what we have here is another proof text that the temple itself was a witness against the Jews, being that the Ark of the Covenant was a witness against the Jews as well as the heavens and the earth. Let's go on. After Moses finished writing in a book the words of this law from beginning to end, he gave this command to the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. He told them, take this book of the law and place it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your God. There it will remain as a witness against you. For I know how rebellious and stiff-necked you are. If you were being rebellious against the Lord while I am still alive and with you, how much more will you rebel after I die? Assemble before me all the elders of your tribes and all your officials so that I can speak these words in their hearing and call heaven and earth to testify against them. For I know that after my death you are sure to become utterly corrupt and to turn away from the way I have commanded you. In days to come, disaster will fall upon you because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord and provoke him to anger by what your hands have made. So, brothers and sisters, we've seen that the creation was held as a witness against the evildoers and prostitutes of the covenant but was also cursed itself in bondage and waiting to be liberated, just as those who are faithful were to be. And just as Noah was saved from his generation by the destroying water. And so too, 
would the remnant church be saved from their generation by fire of God's judgment. They waited patiently for the creation to be destroyed and renewed in this way. In the written testimony of the New Testament, Romans 8, 18, I consider that our present suffer that all present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be, re be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. So the creation isn't simply destroyed, it is renewed and freed from the bondage of decay and the condemnation of being destroyed. So with Jerusalem flooded with fire, we can see that the heavens and earth are burnt away as witnesses against God's people. They will now be witnesses for us in Jesus under new rulership in the new covenant. The age of sin and the law had no more use once Jesus nullified them. Shadows became reality. In Hebrews 9, they are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations, applying until the time of the new order. Revelation 21, he will wipe out every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things have passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Romans 7, but now, by dying to what was once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. So if the law only applied until the new order and Jesus is the new order, then the old order which was the old covenant creation age, is past. This means that under the new covenant, we indeed live under new heavens and new earth. Let's continue. Romans 3.19 Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silent, and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance 
he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. And he did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justify those who are faith in Jesus. In Acts 28, the Holy Spirit spoke through to your forefathers when he said through Isaiah, Go to this people and say, You will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. This is the new age. Jesus told a parable concerning the end of the age. Jesus said that the field he was living in, in his generation, was ripe for the harvest. In Matthew 13, he answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy that who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. And so Jerusalem being burned with fire and destroyed by war marks the end of the age of the old covenant law. And according to Moses, this is because they turned to other gods, hiding God's face from them. This is John's baptism of fire that was sure to come after the baptism of the Spirit on Pen at Pentecost. John went on to say, do you not say four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now the harvests, he harvests the crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. So there we have it. Jesus tells his apostles to look around at the harvest. If this is so, and the, and the harvest was at the end of the age in the first century, then that means that the end of the age was around 70 AD. Because that is when the weeds, the unbelieving Jews, that grew up with the wheat, the Christians, were burned in God's judgment on the world and Jerusalem. It also means that the kingdom has come in their time because of verse 38 of John 4 which says, this battle is between Satan's kingdom and Jesus. This is also parallel to Revelation 14 about the angel swinging the sickle into the grapes and pouring out the wrath of the Lamb. In 1 Corinthians 10, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as a warning for us. The us being back then, on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. Just as Jesus and Peter warned about the example of Noah's and Lot's generations, Paul here warns that about Moses' generation of grumblers. So now, then, there is no question as to what the generation that the flood and fire were to come upon. And it was theirs 2,000 years ago. If not, he would not have said us concerning 
the whom. Matthew 24, 1. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things? He asked. I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately. Tell us, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? The disciples asked him, when the temple being thrown down would occur and knew it would end the current age of the old covenant. Jesus' answer is everything we've already looked into concerning destruction of the city. Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, in here, we, Jesus says that he will be with them to the end of the age. This doesn't mean that in the new age he won't be with them, because he already said he always would be. He is assuring them that however long it takes for that end to come, that he is there. Despite what the scoffers will ar uh, arrogantly protest. In fact, because Jesus is speaking to his apostles directly, it only proves all the more that they would indeed see the end of the age if they survived that long during their persecutions. And also in John 21, 22, Jesus answered, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Now, how could that person remain alive if Jesus wasn't returning, if Jesus wasn't returning to save them? Repeat it, Jesus answered, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? Let's go on. Babylon was worldly Jerusalem, and New Jerusalem was a spiritual dwelling, the church, with God and man, a city not of this world, the kingdom, Jesus' kingdom. And since the old Jerusalem was of the world, it was destroyed with their world, symbolically represented as the temple, melting away in fire from a war with the Gentiles. The people of the city that flooded desolations upon Jerusalem. Again, we will see that the covenants represent cities of God. Galatians 4. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born in the ordinary way, but his son by the free woman was born as a result of the promise. These things may be taken figuratively, for the woman represents two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. So Paul is not inconsistent in saying that the present city of Jerusalem was of no value since it was in slavery. The New Testament only condemns physical Jerusalem. 
It never puts any covenant or hope in it whatsoever. For it is written, Be glad, O barren woman, who bears no children. Break forth and cry aloud, you, have, you who have no labor pains, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has her husband. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of the promise. At that time, the son born in the ordinary way persecuted the son by the power of the Spirit. It's the same now. But what does the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. By saying, get rid of the slave woman, the Bible is saying to get rid of the physical city born of flesh of Jerusalem. And by getting rid of her children, it is saying to destroy that generation. The inheritance is thus spiritual and belongs to Christians born of spirit. And so the city is also spiritual. The new Jerusalem is the church and is part of the new creation after the old is burned up in fire like the flood of war. Let's go on, Matthew 19. Peter answered him, We've left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or fields, for my sake, will receive a hundred times as much, and will inherit eternal life. This renewal of all things was when everything was made new. Even the Jerusalem of the free woman that was above them, coming down out of heaven. The judgment they judged in was against Israel's prostitution. They were stoned to death by Rome's catapults and then burned with fire to get rid of the slave woman and her son. Now, now we've looked at ev uh, everything created new completely, we need to look at what matters most, the new creation in Christ of repentance, eternal life. 2 Corinthians, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Galatians 6, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. Acts 5, go stand in the temple courts and tell the people the full message of this new life. Romans 6, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have, we may too live a new life. Second Corinthians 4. Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light is momentary. Troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs all them. Colossians 3. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken your old self off with its practices, and have put on the new self, which has been renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator through the Messiah being revealed within you and I in us. Ephesians 4, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which has been corrupted by deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds 
and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness to have the mind of Christ to become Christ like and this is what is the Holy Spirit is training us to do so since repentance is the spiritual rebirth it is also the spiritual resurrection Titus 2 for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own eager to do what is good Ephesians 5 for this you can be sure no immoral impure or greedy person such a man is an idolater he has inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and gone sorry has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God let no one deceive you with empty words for because of such things God wrath comes on those who are disobedient therefore do not be partners with them you were once darkness but now you are light in the Lord live as children of light for the fruit of the light consists of goodness righteousness and truth and find out what pleases the Lord having nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness but rather expose them for it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret but everything exposed by the light becomes visible for it is light that makes everything visible this is why it is said wake up O sleeper rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you this directly states that if Christ shines in you that you are risen from the dead this is consistent with Jesus saying that his generation was dead while yet alive John 5 I tell you the truth whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned he has crossed over from death to life I tell you the truth a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live for as the Father has life in himself so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man Jesus directly says that those who hear him and repent have crossed over from death to life this is the beginning of the resurrection of the spirits of men he said himself that his words are spirit and are life since the topic of the resurrection is so broad and a, a lot of time is needed I'll leave it there for now but seeing that Jesus said that he was making all things new and with it a newness of life that calls people from out of the dead while they, while they yet lived physically we see that it had already begun back then how much more does that mean it occurs now and applies to you and me Isaiah 65 you will leave your name to my chosen ones as a curse the sovereign Lord will put you to death but to his servants he will give another name Revelation 2 he who has an ear let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches to him who overcomes I will give some of the hidden manna I will also give him a white stone with a new name on it known only to him who receives it 
Revelation 3. Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on him my new name. What that new name is, I'm not so sure. If the new name we're given is Christian or New Jerusalem or something else, I don't know. It could also be similar to how Jesus changed Simon's name to Peter or Abraham to Abraham. The white stone is, is the, how a vote cast for innocence was shown in court. These people uh, would thus overcome through the judgment as well. And lastly, but not least, the new song that the New Jerusalem sings, Revelation 14. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. So what does all that mean for us? It means we have the written testimony of everything that's been accomplished. And that written testimony is confirmed within our spirit. And now we walk in the fullness of the new. The Holy Spirit in us, Jesus Christ in us, the kingdom in us, us and them all born in union, all things being made new. And so now we're reaping the benefits of what happened all those centuries ago and every generation since then because those things served as an example what they went through and they got their reward just as we would get our reward whatever it is the Lord is putting on each of us our reward will be. He is revealing himself in all he is unveiling so we can know the fullness of him and become Christ-like. And this has gone on right through the generations for everyone who believes in every generation. There's nothing new under the sun. So that unveiling of Christ within, what John was waiting for, is exactly the same for us. And, and we can have that full confidence and speak with boldness assurance and confidence that Jesus Christ is in you and I brothers and sisters the kingdom is here in you and I all things made new through Jesus Christ our Savior Amen